<sighs> Back on track. So the word peace is mentioned over 400 times in Scripture. This morning we said it's 429 times specifically. So apparently it's a big deal to God for you and I to have peace. And if there's ever a time that we need to remember that Jesus is the Prince of Peace, I believe it's right now. Because everywhere you look, it seems like there's calamity and hopelessness, despair, violence, prejudice, fear, anxiety, a mandate, uh, you know, all this, this pressure in our world. Our world is a mess. And yet Jesus says so clearly in the scripture we just read in John chapter 14, verse 27, he says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. It's not as the world gives do I give it. So don't let your hearts be troubled. See, Jesus says, here's my end, and now here's our end. So don't let your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. So you see, the anchoring and the guiding peace of God is already in you as a divine gift. It's one of the many benefits that we receive when we ask Jesus to be our Lord and our Savior. Peace is a hand-delivered gift that you have been given. So our jobs as followers of Christ is to somehow reconcile the difference between what we see with our eyes and what God wants to deposit and has deposited into our lives. To make sure that this gift is not lying here unwrapped, dormant, unused, and unappreciated. We have to unwrap the gifts that God has given to us, and peace is one of them. You know, they say that it's only about 12 to 18 inches, I guess depending upon how tall you are or her, how non-tall you are, 12 to 18 inches from your eyes down to your heart. But how many of you know It seems like a much greater distance when you have to somehow reconcile what you see in the natural with your eyes to what you believe God has spoken to you in your heart. It requires us moving from fear to faith. Because you and I, we have a very real enemy. And although he is invisible, he is not fictional. And the Bible says, as we looked at last week in John 10, that the thief comes for three reasons, to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And I believe out of all the things that the enemy is looking to steal and kill and destroy, peace is almost always at the top of his list. He intentionally stirs up discord, division, disruption, disturbances both around you and within you. He is the author of chaos and confusion, using every opportunity to upset your sense of well-being and stability. See, the enemy wants you uneasy, unbalanced, unsettled, filled with anxiety, worry, and turmoil. He wants you lacking peace. But I believe there's more to it than just you. It's always bigger than just you. Because perhaps like no other attack, the enemy knows that by nibbling away at your peace, he and his demonic entourage, they can cause a ripple effect to fan out in all directions, spreading out to your relationships, corroding them with disagreement and frustration, upsetting your marriage, filling it with worry and distrust, derailing your children as you pass down fear and insecurity to future generations. Whenever you feel an overriding sense of unrest, you have to know that the enemy is somewhere in the middle of it all stirring it up. Anywhere peace is lacking, the enemy is at work. And you can't survive the storms of life without God's peace. So today, as we get started unwrapping this gift of peace, we're going to look at the scripture in Isaiah, chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. You can turn there, or it'll be up on the screen in a moment. And this is typically a passage that is read around the holidays. Isaiah was a prophet in the Old Testament, and a lot of times I think we mistakenly believe that 
the scriptures, the Bible stories and the scriptures that we read were they, they were fashioned and occurred in this sort of blissful, utopian, you know, paradise where everything was sunshine and roses, you know, the Bible. And so maybe that's why there's this disconnect between what we see in Scripture, we read in the Scripture, and what we apply to our lives because the enemy has convinced us that, well, I mean, that doesn't really work for you because it was written in the Bible days. And you, I mean, you know, if anyone could do it, if it was back when Jesus was alive and back in the Bible, but that's not really true. See, the prophet Isaiah, he was living in a world controlled by the Assyrians and the Babylonians. And they were both trying to extinguish the Jews and completely eliminate their worship. The Isaiah prophesies in this book that we're about to read, unbeknownst to him, about the arrival of Jesus. The birth of a baby who would be born into a country outside in horrible conditions in a little town during a wicked and evil time. Very dark time, dominated by this wicked ruler named King Herod. And they're all under the cruel organization called the Roman Empire. These groups dominated by force. They kept the population under control through violence and suppression. And the prophet Isaiah begins to speak of the coming Messiah 700 years before Bethlehem. And this is what he says. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. This is the New Living Translation. And it says, for a child is born to us, a son is born is given to us. Now, I just want to stop really quick. I love this phrase. I think it's beautiful. It moves me in a way that I wonder if we sometimes overlook. For unto us a child is born. A son is given to us. I don't ever want us to lose sight of what God gave. It wasn't just any child. It wasn't just any son. John writes in the third chapter of his book in the New Testament that God so loved the world that he gave his one and his only son. He gave him so that you could have eternal life, so that I could have another chance, so that we could be healed and whole and live in freedom, so that you and I could have this gift of peace. You know, it's one thing to give something that you buy from Amazon. It doesn't really cost me much. You know, I sit in a room, you, you know, with a phone or device, whatever, and you, you click something or Target or Walmart, whatever your place is. You, you click a button. Somebody somewhere goes and buys, gets this thing. They wrap it up. And they mail it to me. And then somebody else comes and delivers it to my door. Or or in the vicinity of it. Sometimes, you know, it's your door, your neighbor's door, your neighbor's neighbor's door. But, you know, it's coming to you. And then you take that thing and then you give it away. That didn't cost you very much. Maybe just the amount of money you had to pay. But it's a completely different thing to give your child. Your one and only son. May we never forget that God loved us so very much that he gave us his son. We didn't deserve it. We can't earn it. Most of the time we won't appreciate it and we'll certainly never be able to repay it. And yet still, a son was given to us. You and I will never be able to outgive God. It's impossible. And sometimes I think that is what the enemy uses to manipulate us. He reminds us, I mean, God gave his son, what you got? What you gonna do? You can't, you can't, you can't even serve God. I know what you did last night, and if they knew, yeah, you'd be done. When in reality, the only response that we can give back to the creator of the universe because of what he gave to us is our surrender and our worship. For unto us 
a child is born. A son is given to us, and the government is going to rest on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His government and its peace will never end. He is the Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and its peace, the Bible says there will be no end. Did you know there is an unlimited supply of the peace of God available for you? Unlimited supply. So it doesn't matter what the enemy presents to you as false evidence appearing real to bring you fear and anxiety and worry and stress. The Bible says of the greatness of his kingdom and the supply of his peace, there is no end. Sorry. There is no end. That was Mimi. She's gone. There is no end. There's an unlimited supply of the peace of God. The peace of God gives us a firm grip in a world that is constantly moving. It gives us stability and it allows us to keep our footing when everything else around us is shifting sand. You know those times. It's like, I, I, can't, I can't get my solid footing. I feel like everything is, is just moving in a wacky kind of place. The peace of God, it gives you stability. God's peace is the only thing that can dig deep enough to give you the kind of anchoring and grounding and security that you need that keeps you from being knocked over and undone by this potent enemy who is always on the loose. And he specifically targets you in those areas when you are weakest or most tender. He's strategic. He studies us. The enemy knows our patterns. He knows our propensities. He knows our struggles. He knows the anxiety that you may be feeling. He knows the triggers that can send you feeling stressful. Listen, that anxiety, that unrest, that worry that you may be feeling, it didn't just happen. It is a plot and a plan of the enemy to render you ineffective for God's kingdom by taking away your peace. A peace that you have been given. Jesus said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. It's his gift that he has given you. And the enemy is so strategic. He knows exactly what to say. He knows exactly what to do. He knows exactly what triggers, what buttons to push. He's watched your story. He's watched your family tree. And that's why the Apostle Paul writes to us in Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 7, He says, we are to be anxious for nothing. nothing. Well, that's easier said than done. (laughs) He says, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, or prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And then the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. See, the peace of God, which which goes beyond anything that I could possibly understand in my human reasoning, it can keep my heart and my mind. It guards your heart and your thoughts in Christ Jesus. See, that word keep is so interesting because it literally means peace will guard like a soldier standing at attention. That's this peace that will keep you and guard you. It's a soldier standing attention. The peace of God, it guides our mind and it guards our heart. It protects and guards you. It's an anchor for your soul. See, the peace of God abiding in our hearts is a sure and a trusty garrison guarding it so the enemy cannot penetrate your mind or your heart. See, your thoughts come from your heart. The Bible says in Proverbs 23, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And you can't control the thoughts that the enemy sends your way. We say he's strategic. He's studying you. He knows. He knows. He knows this is a hard time of year for you. He knows you struggle with this. He knows your, your, what your bank account looks like. He knows the things that you've been saying. He knows what's happening with your kids. He knows what's happening at your job. He knows what's happening in your family. And he is behind the scenes trying to figure out how he can use whatever's going on to his advantage. That's what the enemy does. So you can't control what thoughts he sends to your mind. 
But you can control what you do with them. You can be like, listen, I know that. I know that. I know the bank account does look rough. But you know what? My Bible says that I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor their seed out begging for bread. So, God, I know you're going to provide. I don't know how you're going to do it, but that's on you. You're going to do it. Father, I thank you that you are Jehovah Jireh. You said you would meet all of my needs according to your riches in Christ Jesus. So I thank you, Father. I'm trusting you to do what you can do. Listen, I know my kids are acting crazy, but Father, you said, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Father, you said that, that your faithfulness will endure to a thousand generations. So Father, I thank you that my children will rise up and they will call me blessed. I thank you that they are disciples taught of the Lord. Blessed is their peace and undisturbed composure that they're blessed when they're coming in, that they're blessed when they're going out. I don't know what the enemy's trying to do, but I'm going to tell you right now that when you said the enemy comes in like a flood, that you're going to raise up a standard. So God, I thank you that you're raising up a standard. Here's the thing. You can't control those thoughts. But you can control whether or not they take root in your heart. Proverbs 4.23 says, Above all else, guard your heart. For out of your heart come the issues of your life. Can you see now why the enemy is after your peace? It disrupts your mind. It deceives your heart. And ultimately because he wants to destroy your life. Listen, it's not our job to determine how God's going to bring restoration. Yeah. That's not my job. My job is to trust him. Yeah. I remember after my Jessica, my daughter was killed almost five years ago, this next week. And I couldn't get, I don't, God, I don't know how. Ah, Romans 8, 28, and we know in all things God works together for the good of those who love him and remain called according to his purpose. And I'm like, God, I don't know how you can turn this for good. And I'm, I mean, I'm not really sure that I get it now either, but I'm just saying, I'm a little further down the road. And I'd be like, but that's not my job. You said that you're going to work all things together for my good. For my good and for your glory, God. So you can't control what happens to you. You can control what you do with it. Peace is a gift that God has given you. It is a hand-delivered gift given to you by Jesus Christ. And the enemy wants to come and rob you of that peace because he knows it's your inheritance. He wants to destroy your life. Scripture reminds us that peace stands at attention over your heart and your soul, even in the middle of trouble. Look at Isaiah 26, 3. This is the New Living Translations again. It says, you will keep him. Who's going to keep him? God. You will keep him in perfect peace, all who trust in you. Not all those who trust in their bank account. Not all those who trust in their own abilities. All those who trust in you. All those whose thoughts are fixed on you. The mind that he keeps in perfect peace is the mind that is fixed on him. Well, why is it fixed on him? Because it trusts him. Colossians 3.15 And let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace. We should get along. And always be thankful. The messages of these passages are tied together. When we choose thankful prayer over wallowing in anxiety and worry, we are demonstrating an unwavering trust in God. Listen, I know what it looks like in the natural. <laughs> you do too. But I also know that God knows. And I'm going to choose to trust in Him. See, prayer covered in gratitude expresses a firm faith. Concentrating on him instead of being absorbed by all the circumstances of our life, it tells the Lord that I believe he is able to override and overcome even the most difficult issues. Like, in, Have you heard that meme? It says instead of talking to um, the Lord about your problems, why don't you talk to your problems about the Lord? You know, it's like, hello, have you met my God yeah. who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that I could ask or think that he is at work perfecting those things that concern me. And he said he would be faithful to complete the work that he began until the day of his return. I believe this kind of faith, it catches his attention. And then he responds by activating his peace within us. 
There's a progression of peace. See, trust leads to thankfulness. And the thankfulness activates peace. God's peace brings a calmness to your soul as you walk through life. Peace is not only your guard, it's also your guide. But peace is better experienced than it is explained. Have you ever tried to explain to somebody the peace of God? It's difficult to do. But if you have experienced the peace of God, you're like, listen, you can't talk me out of it. I have laid on the floor thinking, I don't know how I'm going to take my next breath. And the peace of God washed over me and it gave me life. It sustained me. So I, don't, I can't explain it, but once you experience it, it's like nothing else in the world. So what are some ways that we can unwrap God's peace? Number one, we've got to see God's provision. See God's provision. I believe the number one goal of the enemy is to keep you focused on what you don't have. Which means I've got to constantly remind myself of God's provision in my life. Zoom out the lens for your life. Don't let what you have rob you of what you don't have. Don't allow what you're missing take away from the the stuff that you're making. Don't allow the memories of yesterday rob and steal your moments of today. See, gratitude, it turns whatever you have into enough. It's enough. Trust activates thanksgiving, and thanksgiving activates peace. Psalms 112, 6 through 8 says, Surely the righteous will never be shaken. Amen. They will be remembered forever. They will have no fear of bad news. Yes, Jesus. Their hearts are steadfast, trusting in the Lord. See, God has never forsaken you. And the good news is, he's not going to start now. He's not going to fail you. He is faithful always. When we are faithless, he still is faithful. Hallelujah. You've got to remember all the things that God has done for you, all the times he came through. He woke you up today in your right mind. You're wearing clothes. You're able to walk in here of your own ability. He's been so good to you. Psalms 54, 4 says, Surely God is my help. The Lord is the one who sustains me. He's the one. You've got to remember the victories that you've had, all the times that God came through. Because, see, the enemy's going to remind you of all the worries that you've got, all the what ifs, well, what if, well, what if, well, what if. You've got to remind yourself, begin to speak out all the times that God came through. Remind yourself of how God has saved you, how his faithfulness is going to endure to a thousand more generations, and how you're going to continue making it. A lot of times we have short-term memory where God is concerned. Instead of remembering what he's done, it's kind of like, what have you done for me lately? And God's up there like, hey, hey, I need you to remember what I have done. In the old days, they would make a memorial, right? They they would build this altar to remember. So they would remember what God has done for them. When my kids were little, we would drive to school, and we had these confessions that we would say, every day, and uh, I would begin to pray for them. And one of the things that I would pray is I would ask the Holy Spirit to interrupt their day, that they would be aware of divine interruptions by the Holy Spirit. And I would say, I don't care where you do it, Lord, but I just ask Holy Spirit that you would interrupt them, that they would see that you're with them, whether it's in the classroom or in athletics or at the lunch table or with their friends. And let me tell you, they never came home and said, Mom, guess what? The Holy Spirit interrupted my day. That's not my kids. They never did that. But I wanted them to know that they were never alone, that God was with them, that his presence and his peace was a constant companion for them. See, it's easy for us to take for granted all that God has done for us. And I think the enemy does some of his best work in ungrateful hearts. 1 Timothy 6.17 says, Teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. Boy, that's true. Stock market's up, and then it's down. Harsh market's up, then it's down. You got a lot, then a little. Their trust should be in God, who richly gives us all that we need for our enjoyment. 
I love this. Don't trust in the things of the world. It's unreliable. We place our trust in God. He alone is our hope. He alone is our peace. He alone is our provision. To begin to unwrap this gift of peace, you've got to see God's provision. The second thing is you have to surrender to God's plan. Surrender to God's plan. And if you're like me sitting here right now, you're like, got it. That's so simple. I, this is so good. I'm, I got to see God's provision. Hallelujah. Surrender to God's plan. Hallelujah again. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Yes, Jesus. But I, I, I mean, who doesn't want God's plan? I know the plans I have for you, says Jeremiah 29, 11, right? They're plans that are good and not for disaster. I came to give you a hope and a future. We're all like, yeah, I like that plan. But we have to surrender to God's plan. So I just want to talk just for just a brief moment about what surrender means. Because that's really where it, the good stuff happens. Surrender, it means to agree to stop fighting hiding, or resisting. Or it could mean to give the control of or the use of something to someone else. Or it could mean to allow someone or something to influence you or to control you. That's surrender. So if I surrender, just taking that definition and applying it, that means someone else is in charge. Listen, for those of us who are over-responsible, that's my code word for control freaks. For those of us who are over-responsible, it can be a little unnerving for us not to be in control or in charge. But you remember our scripture back in Isaiah said, for a child is born to us. A son is given to us. The government's going to rest on his shoulders. And he'll be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So that phrase, Prince of, Priest, Prince of Peace, is so interesting. Because in Greek, Prince means the one who's in charge. The one who's in charge of living in peace, the one that's in charge to be at peace, the one who's in charge to bring peace. One of the names of Jesus is that he is Jehovah Shalom. He is our peace. He is our prince of peace. See, it's not your job to supply the peace. It's not even your spouse's job to supply the peace. It's not your bank account's job to supply the peace. It's not even your friend's job to supply the peace. He alone is our peace. And so often, I think we try to find peace in our own way. Maybe this relationship, you know, I, I got this new friend. Oh, gosh, I got this new friend. Things are just rolling. I'm, like, having a lot of trouble with you guys today. I'm not sure what's happening. I got this new relationship. Things are rolling around great. It's going to give me the peace that I'm looking for. I just, I just feel so peaceful around them for two months. Oh, you know what? I got this job, and the job, it is so good. It's, it's going to give me a bonus, so that's going to really bring a lot of peace. I've been ex experiencing a lot of you know, just worry and anxiety, finances. It's going to, it's going to, and so it does. It brings you until they require more work, and now you can't spend time with your family, and so now you've got some turmoil at home. But you've got more money, but you know, it, it didn't really give the peace that you're wanting. And all the while, Jesus is over there being like, hey, 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 come to me. Come to me. See, I don't just have peace. I am peace. I am the prince of peace. And if you would surrender control, see, I am the one who's supposed to be supplying your peace. But he's a gentleman. And he'll never force his way in, even though he knows he has what we need. He'll never override our will or manipulate our choices. So in order for us to begin to experience his peace, we have to surrender to God's plan, surrender to his will. And most likely, we will not always agree. We're probably not always going to like it. Yeah. It's not going to always feel good. That's right. But that's why it's called surrender. To begin to experience peace, we have to surrender to God's plan. Look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11. It says, furthermore, because we are united with Christ, 
we have received an inheritance from God. For he chose us in advance and he makes everything work out according to his plan. God wants everything to work out more than you do. He does. That's his plan. But he requires that you and I surrender to him. We're going to be talking next month in January about a generous life, surrendering in your finances, and it's going to be tricky. Because we like to surrender. We want the blessings of God, but you've got to go his way. And we don't, like, I just can't get out of this funk. I'm like, are you tithing? Because that requires trust. I have to trust that God will do more with 90% than I can do with 100. And we don't like to do that. Well, it's my money. I'm like, is it your money? Or did he give you the ability to gain wealth so that you could help establish his covenant here on the earth? Is it you? Or did he wake you up and strengthen you and keep you in your right mind and enable you to do what you can do so that you could give back to him? People don't want to hear that. Well, you just after my money. Listen, I don't need your money. And God don't need your money either. He needs you. It's trust. You've got to surrender to his plan. He may choose a different route than you would. He may choose different friends than you would. He may require a little more than you wanted to give. He may ask you to go somewhere or to do something that you didn't want to do. A mission trip. I thought a mission trip was going to Walmart. Well, it is kind of in a different way. (laughs) But when he is in control, we just read it. He makes everything work out according to his plan. And you have to trust and believe that his plans are good and not of evil, that he came to give you a hope and a future. To unwrap the gift of peace, we have to see God's provision. Number two, we have to surrender to God's plan. And number three, you've got to surround yourself with God's presence. Peace is a gift that the enemy wants to rob from you. See his provision. Surround, surrender to God's plan. Surround yourself with God's presence. 2 Thessalonians 3.16 says, Now may the Lord himself, the Lord of peace, pour into you his peace in every circumstance and in every possible way. The Lord's tangible presence be with you. God wants to pour his peace into every circumstance, into every possible way in your life. I love that the creator of the universe is into you that much. Like he is all about you. He's like, I want to give you my peace in every circumstance, in every way. His presence to be with you. Every single one of you, peace that surpasses anything you can understand. It reminds me of a story I read about a king who offered a prize to the artist who would paint the best picture of peace. And many artists tried to paint the picture. The king looked at all the pictures, but there really were just two that he liked. And he had to kind of choose between the two of them. And the first picture, one picture, it was of a calm lake. The lake was this perfect mirror, peaceful towering mountains above. Overhead was a blue sky with fluffy white clouds. And all the people who saw this picture, they thought, oh my gosh, that is perfect peace. But the other picture, it had mountains too. They were a little more rugged and bare, and above was an angry sky from which the rain fell and the the lightning played. And down the side of the mountain tumbled a long, foaming waterfall. It didn't really look peaceful at all to a lot of people, but when the king looked, he saw behind the waterfall there was a tiny bush growing in the crack in the rock. And in the nest, in that bush, a mother bird had built her nest. And there in the middle of the rush of the angry water sat the mother bird on her nest. Perfect peace. 
What picture do you think the king chose? The king chose the second picture. Because he explained that peace does not mean that you're in a place where there's no noise, no trouble, no hardship, no sorrow, nothing, chaos. Peace means to be in the middle of all those things and still be calm in your heart. That's peace. Shalom, the Hebrew word for peace that's found all throughout the Old Testament, doesn't refer to the absence of chaos, but rather to an overall deeply entrenched sense of harmony that's found even in the middle of chaos. In fact, true peace is best detected and measured against the backdrop of commotion and confusion. When, when inability abounds around you, when instability abounds around you, when it seems, gosh, unstable and unsure, and yet you're able to remain steadfast and upright, that's peace. When disappointment and confusion and chaos is near, and yet you're still standing strong in the power of the Lord and in His might, that's peace. That's how you know you're living with this gift, the peace of God. Because it bypasses all of our human understanding. People from the outside look in, they're like, I, I don't know how you are in your right mind. And you're like, it's God. It's his peace, which guides my mind and guards my heart. Peace is found not in the absence of chaos, but in the presence of Christ. I want to read one more time the scripture that's been continuous throughout our service from John chapter 14, verse 27. This is from the Passion Translation. And he says, I leave the gift of peace with you. It's my peace. Not the kind of fragile peace given by the world, but my perfect peace. And then he gives us a job. Don't yield to fear or be troubled in your hearts. Instead, be courageous. Be courageous. Let the Holy Spirit surround you and allow him to replace those insecurities, the worry, the stress. Allow him to replace it with this gift, this perfect peace that God has given to you. This beautiful gift. Unwrap it today. And experience the peace of God that is yours. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your peace. I thank you that you left it for us because you knew we needed it. <laughs> you knew life was going to be rough. There were going to be moments that were unsure. That we would find ourselves unsteady. And so we're grateful for this gift of peace. Your peace. Perfect peace. I pray today, God, that you would help us to see your provision, to surrender to your plan, to surround ourselves with your presence so that we can fully unwrap this gift that you have given us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen. Can we stand to our